while we do the scripture reading together. Well, I'm going to change the program. Have a seat for a moment. <laughs> uh, this morning, um, as we come to the Lord, we like to honor those who have given their lives or who have served to protect this nation and uh, give us the freedom that we have. So if you this morning have been serving in the military or are serving in the military, would you please stand up so we may honor you? Any military here this morning? We've got back there. Hey, Rick. Very well. We want to thank you men for your service to this country to keep us safe. And uh, so let's give them a good round of applause. Thank you all. Okay, if you would please rise again, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to be reading from the book of Psalms, Psalm 85 this morning, verses 1 through 7. And it says here, Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God, of your salvation, of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are certainly grateful this morning that you are the one true living God. You are sovereign over all of creation. And Father, we are grateful for your mercy. We are grateful for your grace that you bestow upon us each and every day. We're thankful, Lord, that you have provided a way for us to be reconciled to you through your precious son, Jesus, and what he has done at the cross. And we are grateful this morning for the sacrifice that you have made. And Father, we are thankful that we can come together freely here this morning and worship you and praise you and give thanks and put our cares and concerns out before you. You tell us to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. And Father, we are thankful that you first loved us. And Father, this morning as we come together to worship you and praise you, Father. We remember those who are not able to come out this morning, and we just want to lift them up to you, uh, those who hopefully can uh, be able to uh, view the message this morning through uh, live stream. And Father, we are grateful. We're grateful for your goodness to these folks. And Lord, we uh, pray that you'll continue to bless them, that you will protect them, Lord, from falls or harm or accident, Lord. And we pray that your spirit will be working uh, in their hearts this morning. And Father, as we remember those, we also want to remember those, Father, who have served in this nation and uh, to keep us safe and give us the freedoms that we have. We know, Father, without your guidance and out your direction and your sovereign uh, care over us that we would have no freedom and we're thankful for those who have uh, put their life on the line to uh, keep our freedom safe here and how Lord we go after the evil of the world and try to better it and we're thankful for those who serve Lord and we just want to lift them up before you and pray your blessing on them and your protection around them. we pray that you will give wisdom Lord to our nation and to those Lord who serve to protect us that uh, father they would be able to have victory in battle and uh, Lord we ask that it would all be done for your glory and Father we thank you this morning that we uh, have your word and beginning to uh, prepare for that and we ask God that you would prepare our hearts and uh, our minds to hear your word Lord help us to set aside those things that have been 
heavy on us this week and those distractions that come about, help us to concentrate fully upon your word. And Father, we also want to thank you for the great day yesterday at the men's retreat and how, Lord, you have uh, really encouraged us through your word and the importance of the fellowship of believers. And uh, Lord, we are grateful and thankful for how you got us there safely and uh, you encouraged us and strengthened us and brought us back safely. So Father, as we go now to your word and continue to worship you, may all be done for your glory and for your praise, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our song of the month uh, brings together several scriptural ideas and I would challenge you as we uh, sing this throughout this month, uh, today being the first day we're singing this together, uh, but as we do that, that you would consider which scriptures uh, draw from which this song is drawn. Um, as we sing together, his mercy is more. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Patience would wait as we constantly roam. What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Since they are many, his mercy is more. And that will become more familiar as we sing it together throughout the month. Pastor? Well, good morning, everyone. Good to have everybody out this morning. Um, I do want to just mention, if you're a guest with us, we're thrilled that you're here. And if you would fill out a visitor's card, you should have received a packet as you came in. And in that packet is a visitor's card. And if you'd fill that out, place that in the offering when it comes around. That could be your offering to us. Um, did have a good men's retreat uh, this past weekend. And um, a good teaching and a good time of fellowship. Great singing. The, when the men sing in one room together, it's really, really quite, quite a worship, really neat. <laughs> and um, so... Uh, so anyway, so it was really good. I talked to Brian, the uh, director of, the, of, the, of Camp Calvary, and I'm excited about next year as well. We're going, Tim Jordan will be, will be speaking for the men, and Faith Taylor will be speaking for the women for the ladies' uh, retreat, who is excellent. Very, very good. I've heard, uh, heard her speak on several occasions. Well, I've never heard her speak in person. I've heard her speak with uh, listening to DVDs and things, C or CDs and MP3s, that kind of thing before. And she's excellent, so I'm looking forward to next year with retreats. And if you weren't able to go this year, I'd really encourage you to, to really think about next year for that. Pray for those who are sick. We've got quite a few that are sick, and, sick um, that um, aren't able to make it out today. And uh, I guess it's just the time of the year is happening. It's cold weather out. But uh, keep those who are sick in prayer as well. 
And I just want to add my uh, thanks to uh, what Harry said about our veterans. We are very grateful to you for your service to this country, and uh, we hope that you do feel honored today. Gentlemen, if you come forward for the offering. And let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of gathering this morning. We thank you that our sins, they are many, but your mercy is more. And, Lord, that should not cause us to, to have a sense of, of licentiousness or a sense that we can just do whatever we want, but experiencing your grace and your mercy ought to cause us to have a gratefulness and a love for you that propels us to serve you. It is just our reasonable service, according to Romans 12, to give of ourselves, to present our, as our, ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto you. But Lord, your desire for us is not to, not to serve out of, out of a motive of, of, um, of guilt or even duty. Our, your desire primarily is for us to serve out of a motive of love. And uh, we pray that you'd help us to, to know the gospel so much that we know your love so clearly and deeply that it causes us to love you. We love you because you first loved us. And that gratefulness for the grace that you have given us, may it cause us to serve you and live for you and want to live for you. Lord, we thank you for this church and we thank you for the missionaries that are supported by our church, Lord, and we pray for them that you would help us, as, help them as they are on the field to be careful to give the gospel clearly and to plant churches and to disciple people. They're doing the same kind of work that we're doing here, and I pray, Lord, that um, as we serve together and cooperate with other missionaries and partner with them, that we would uh, know them and uphold them in prayer. Lord, we do pray as well for the offering. We thank you for it. And as we give, of you, give to you, uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see that that's what we're doing. We're not giving to just an organization or a person or anything like that, but we're giving to you. And help us to have that kind of heart. And we think of the message to come in the book of Acts as uh, you, were, you are developing the first Gentile church in Acts chapter 11 and uh, you're causing people to be saved and to discipled, and you're, we're seeing, we'll be seeing the gifts of encouragement and teaching used, and, and all of what happened, the generosity that resulted from the discipleship that occurred there in that passage. Father, may, may you help us to grow and to develop in that way that we just have a desire and a spirit to love you and to love others and to give to others. And we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.
We're going to sing a few more songs together before we hear the message from God's word. For the next song, though, uh, we're going to be dismissing the children downstairs for their junior church time. If you're visiting with us and you want to see where the children are going, meet their teachers, uh, feel free to head down with them. They're going to head through the center doors and head downstairs, and then you can come back and join us in time for the preaching. But we'll stand together now as we sing By the Gentle Waters. It's number 170 in the hymnal, if you want to use that. By the Gentle Waters. Children, you can be dismissed. By the gentle water, you will safely lead me. In green pastures, lead me, knowing what is best. Though I often stray, wander far away, I can hear. Just in case, since our PowerPoint piece is a little blinky today, it's number 170 in the hymnal. You may want that for this song in the next. Number 170 by the Gentle Waters, verse 2. There's no need to fear when the shepherd's near. When your voice I hear, I find if you would continue standing as we sing the last song if you need to sit down that's fine but we're going to sing Jesus the son of God Jesus is the son of God the Lord of all the chosen one the son of man the king singing today. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts chapter 11 this morning. Acts 11. And I want to announce something. Uh, I want to announce that Tim and Carol Overstreet are candidates for membership now. So you can uh, ask them questions and grill them hard. In a couple of weeks, we'll, I'm joking about that, of course. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, take them, bring them up. Oh, that's a good idea. Have them over for, for grilling. That'd be good. 
in the middle of winter now at 22 degrees outside. Um, but yeah, they are, mem they are uh, now candidates for membership, so in a couple of weeks we will take them into our membership, Lord willing. Um, and we are looking today at Acts chapter 11, and what I want to do is go ahead and begin by reading the first 17 verses. In the first 17 verses, you have an account of Peter who is, who is rehearsing what occurred with, between him and Cornelius and all of what took place in the previous chapter. And so there's not a lot to comment on on that section because it's really just a rehearsal of what's already been said. So we'll read that as our scripture reading this morning, and then we will, uh, we will get into the message, which will cover uh, a couple of comments from that passage, and then we'll, we'll work through the rest of the passage. So let's, let's begin in, uh, in Acts chapter 11. It says, Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again and from heaven, What God has cleansed you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were done, drawn up again into heaven. At the, that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who had said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all the household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they, began, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, then God has granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we anticipate a message from your word that we ask, Lord, that your spirit would be working in our hearts to receive the things that we see in your word clearly. And I pray, Lord, that this would not be simply a rehearsal of history, but we would see your sovereign working in this narrative to bring about a church that is growing and healthy and developing and then branching out even learning things like generosity. Lord, we pray that you would help us as a church to learn the things that you want us to learn as well from this passage. We thank you for the privilege of being able to gather today and to learn. And I pray that you would teach us, convict us, and encourage us as well. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So this, uh, this past week, I got a very interesting phone call, and some of you may have already seen this on social media, but I'll rehearse it again for you. Uh, I got a call, and this lady, um, in a rather official voice, said that, um, that our church was going to lose power in an hour, that she was ready to come out with her truck. She told me the truck number, and she said we were going to be coming out to cut off your power because you... You, don't, um, you haven't paid your, your bill, your past due on your bill. Uh, and I thought, 
that's strange. She said, did you receive notification of this in the mail? And I said, no. <laughs> and um, I thought, well, I don't really check the mail, but I don't think, I think I would have known about that. And, um, and I thought, and I'm sure we pay our bill. And, but, I, but I thought, well, this sounds pretty official. And she said, oh, well, if you haven't received notification, you need to call this 800 number. So I called the 800 number. And I was skeptical, but it all sounded very official. And, and when I called the 800 number, literally, it sounded just like BG&E. It said, you have reached BG&E, press 1 for this, press 2 for this, press 3 for this. And uh, she had given me directions to press 2 for billing, and so I pressed 2 for billing. And her name was Alexis, and Alex answered the phone. And then I thought, I, gave, I, that, that, I started going, Alexis and Alex, it's interesting. So he explained that, he said, I'm really sorry you didn't receive notification and we're going to give you a 25% discount on your next bill, but we need to, you need to pay immediately um, or you're going to have your power turned off. And I said, really? I said, uh, okay, what do I need to do to pay? And he said, you need to go down to the local Dollar General. <laughs> I went, whoa, <laughs> okay. And pay cash, $498.50. At Dollar General, and uh, there's a payment center there, and then you will be able to your power will be turned on. He said you better you, you need to do it soon, or the power is going to be turned off. And uh, at that point, I said, "Who are you again?" <laughs> and he said, "I'm I'm I'm uh, I'm Alex." And I said, uh, "Oh, okay." I said, "What's your job title?" And he said, "I don't know what you're asking." I said, "You don't know what I'm asking? I'm asking your job title. What is your job title?" He said, he said, well, I don't know what you're asking. I'm an agent with BG&E, and I don't know what you're asking, but do you have any other questions? I said, no, and I hung up the phone. Now, and didn't go and pay the $498 at Dollar General, and somehow we still have lights, um, and did double check to make sure we did pay the bill, and we definitely did, and there was no issue on that end. And what we had is a scam, and I called BG&E and I let them know that it was indeed a scam and they took on all kinds of information to make, because they didn't like the fact they were being impersonated by somebody else. So, so in the first part of that conversation, it all sounded like it could, it's plausible. I mean, even they had set it up so that you call another number and they had preset options and it seemed very, very official. And I was... I, I thought they must have had a clerical error. It, we pay our bill, but they had some sort of clerical error. I was up to the point where they said Dollar General. I was at least thinking it was plausible. But it wasn't at all. When, you, when, when, they, when, you, when they began to present the fact, the, the, these kinds of things of how you would pay and all that, it, the whole thing broke down. You know, sometimes we have experiences in our lives, and they seem... They seem to tell us to go a direction, or we have a certain kind of experience that we then come to a conclusion about one thing or another. We, we ought to be very careful about trusting our experiences. It's important for us to realize that our experiences can deceive us. You cannot trust your experience. Now, are some experience legitimate? Well, of course they are. Some experiences with God, are they legitimate? Yes, they are. We were at, at the, um, we were at the uh, uh, men's conference yesterday, and there was quite a bit of discussion in, at, the, uh, at the men's retreat, and we're talking about how to study the Bible and the importance of studying the Bible in, the, in a way that is going to actually produce strength. Um, can I get you guys just to turn this off? We don't need it today. It's flashing a lot, and it's just going to be distracting. So go ahead and just shut it off, uh, please. So um, even that's going to flash, so go ahead and really shut it off. Um, so anyway, that's worse. <laughs> anyway. Okay, thank you. All right, if it wasn't distracting you, it was distracting me. So anyway, um, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, so the men's retreat. So... So anyway, so, um, so basically, we were, it was a situation where somebody said, you know, we're talking about using commentaries and making sure that we, we, we consult other things, and one person said, well, you know, I think 
that um, I just, you know, I've learned to throw all the commentaries out and just pray and read God's word, and in a couple of weeks, I'll usually come up with the answer. And the uh, the doctor, uh, uh, doc, the the what is it, Doctor Overholt? What's his name? Ollinger. That's right. Doctor Ollinger said uh, said um, uh, he said well he said it's it's good to have experiences with the Lord. He said, but you know you could be wrong. <laughs> and he said he said he he said well I don't like the commentaries because th- I find that they disagree with each other and they could be wrong. And he says, well, if they could be wrong, it means you could be wrong, right? <laughs> and the guy had absolutely nothing to say, which is good. He needed to stop talking at that point. But see, see we, we ought not trust our experience. And you know why we shouldn't trust our experience? Because part of our experience has to do with our heart. If you read a book and you, got, and you have straight facts from a book, as long as that book is reliable then you're not really dealing with your heart. But when you experience something, then you're, you're interfacing with your heart. And what does the Bible say about our heart? It's, it is deceitful and desperately wicked. Folks, we ought to be very careful. We cannot trust our experience alone. Now, it's, why do I bring all that up? Because as we're going through the book of Acts and we're seeing, we're seeing experiences, we're seeing Peter experience this vision and we're seeing cornelius experience his own vision and they come together and peter presents the gospel to uh to to uh cornelius and cornelius and his household come to christ but then peter now the apostles are hearing all of this and they're a little skeptical and it isn't i think it isn't necessarily wrong for them to be skeptical to ask peter some questions But it's really important for us to see how Peter answers the question. So you'll notice in chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, the apostles are asking uh, Peter, saying, hey, we heard that that you have eaten with Gentiles and that you have fellowship with Gentiles. Can you explain what's going on? And as we just read, Peter goes through and he explains what's going on. So then we find in verse, um, we we pick up here then with, with that in mind, we find in verse 16, Then I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, what's the significance of that? Do you see what Peter does here? Peter accounts his experience and Cornelius' experience and how God did all this, but then he says, I recalled the word of the Lord. He compared his experience with the word. And it, and it was consistent with what the Word of God actually said. The Word of God actually said that this was going uh, to happen. The Lord of God actually, in the Old Testament even, it prophesied that the Gentiles would be grafted in. This, Peter's experience was consistent with the Word of God. And with that in mind, with all of that, he explains in verse 17... If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand who? God. He realized that they had been given the Spirit of God. He realized all of what was happening was according to the Word of God. And he said, I've got to submit to the will of God. And that that ought to be the way that we live our lives. Yes, we have experiences, but every experience must be worked through the lens of God's Word to help us to understand the validity of that experience. And what was the result? What was the the response? The response was they became silent. Verse 18. What does it mean that they became silent? They had nothing else to say. I mean, Peter had presented his case. He had gone through the experiences that he had had. He had validated it with Scripture and realized that his experience matched Scripture. By the way, if his experience didn't match match Scripture, do you suppose that the apostles would have been silent? If he would have said something in his experience that was different than what the Bible says, do you suppose they would have said, well, wait a minute, Peter, your experience is not matching the Bible? I'm sure he would have. 
But because it did, they were silent. They had nothing to say. And they simply said, it, it, then we would, it appears that God has grafted the Gentiles in, essentially, that the Gentiles have been granted repentance to life. Now, with all of that in mind, we need to just realize the importance of us being careful when it comes to our own experiences and making sure that we have the kind of experience that is consistent with the Word of God and we use the Word of God to, uh, to help us understand our experiences. Then what occurs in verse 19? We pick up in verse 19 and it says, Now those who are scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word uh, to, one, to no one but the Jews only. You see, they're preaching the word of the Jews only. Uh, Luke, who's the writer of the book of Acts, is noting in verse 19, he sort of bring the telescope out a little bit, helping people to see the big picture of what's happening, citing the fact that Stephen was martyred, and from that point, what was going on, and then it says, verse 20, but some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists or the Greeks, or we'll put it this way more clearly for us, the Gentiles, preaching the Lord Jesus. So Luke explains that all, not only was Peter having this experience with Cornelius and Cornelius' household comes to Christ, but this was happening other places as well, and it was particularly happening in this place of Antioch. You have several regions that are mentioned here. You have Phoenicia and Cyprus and Paphos. But the one that I want to really focus on is this, Antioch, is, is this place of Antioch. And you see here the very first phase is the missionary work from Jerusalem ends up into these, in, in, into these locations and Antioch now becomes a prominent location. And it's going to continue to be a prominent location. So far, what has the, the hub of Christian activity, where has that been? Well, it's in, right, it's been in Jerusalem. Now it's moving now, though, it's going to stay in Jerusalem to, to an extent, for sure. No question about it. We're going to find a council that's meeting in, in Acts 15. But now Antioch is going to become another major hub. Now, what is the significance of Antioch? Well, Antioch is the third largest city in the Roman world. It is known for its elaborate cosmopolitan lifestyle, the people in, the, in, the, in that city. It was, it was also known for its decadence and its sin. This was a place where God was choosing to, to focus in on so that these people could come to Christ, and that's indeed what was happening. Antioch was the capital of the Roman province of Syria. It was a, it was a major place where, where people were coming. There were the Roman roads, almost all of them were, found their confluence in this area. There was constant commerce and traffic and going in and out. And it provided a very good hub where the gospel, the, the church could be established and the gospel could continue to go out from there. And you will find that that is some of how God works in his missionary, missionary endeavors, sovereignly working people to different areas, is that he often does choose these hubs of major cities to place people in so that they can then from there branch out for the sake of the gospel. And we can, we can be thankful for the second phase here of some unnamed people that came from Cyprus. Cyprus was, a, was an island in the Mediterranean. They came from that area, and they went and they preached the Lord Jesus Christ to, to the Greeks. And you'll see here then in verse 21, it says, the result of all this, is that the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. I want to pause and just comment on this idea. This is a prominent phrase here, that the hand of the Lord was with them. We see this kind of thing throughout the book of Acts. Haven't we seen this before? Where it'll say the Spirit of God is on them, or the Spirit of God is filling them. It's going to say that about Barnabas later on. Or the hand of God is on them, or God worked this out. It, folks, 
it is clear. If you look at the book of Acts and all you see is a historical document of what happened to the church, you're not seeing enough. Because what we actually see in the book of Acts is we see God sovereignly working out his plan and his hand is on it. And when I read that, was looking at that, it really, I just sort of sat back, sat back for a minute in my office and thought about the fact that how much we need God's strength and how much we need God's hand on our ministry in order to do what God wants us to do. You know, it's easy even for a pastor, it's easy for me or for others to just so, get so caught up in, in, in just doing the next thing, one thing after another after another. There's schedules to fill and, and agendas to take care of and things to prepare for. And, and you can become so occupied with those things that you begin to do those kinds of things in the flesh. You begin to rely on your own strength and your own ability and, what, and, and don't consider that everything that we do ought to be done with God's strength. We want God's hand on this. If God's hand is not on this ministry, then it becomes something that is, that is a skeleton of what God really wants it to be. And we need to be very careful about that. We need to be aware of that. Zechariah 4.6, when God had called the nation of Israel to finish Zerubbabel's temple and all the prophecies that we find in Zechariah, God says this, this is the word of the Lord to, to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. We see the importance of showing ourselves, of the, of, of, we want God to be able to show Himself strong in our lives. We need His help. We need His hand on us. We need His strength in order to do what God wants us to do. Folks, frankly, that's not just in our ministry, it's in, our, it's in your family, it's in our lives as individuals. We ought never think to ourselves that we, are, we can just handle it on our own. That kind of pull yourself up by your own bootstraps mentality that's so prevalent in our Western world is not something that God, that God is pleased with. God wants us to take personal responsibility, but God wants us to be dependent on His strength to do what we cannot do for ourselves. You recall in the book of 1 Corinthians, it actually tells us that, that God is the one that gives the increase. And we must always remember that. And that, why did all these people come to Christ? Well, it wasn't because of the great efforts of, of God's people in the sense of them doing what they did in their own strength. You'll, you'll notice that these people are unnamed. The people that came to Antioch, we don't have the names there. Why? Because the emphasis that Luke wants in this particular case is to demonstrate that God's hand was here doing what God was doing. And we need to understand that we need that as well in our lives. I cannot, I think of the song, the song that says, I cannot live without him. And that ought to be the cry of our hearts as well. Well, these people are coming to Christ, they're the, the church is growing, they're branching out even and reaching others for Christ. And we pick up in verse 22 and we're going to begin to see that, that the Jerusalem church wants to provide support. Look at verse 22. Then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord so we have this 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 working of Jerusalem and we don't know exactly how it was set up whether whether there was a, a, a decision to for Barnabas to literally be a sanctioning of the church in Antioch or whether they were just trying to su 
provide support. And we see the emphasis that Luke has is clearly support in verse 23. And he came and had seen, and, and had seen grace of God. He was glad and encouraged them all with purpo- that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. Folks, what we see in verse 23 is, is Barnabas at work under the Spirit of God, in the work of the Spirit of God. Barnabas is a man who we have known already as to be one who is, has the gift of exhortation or encouragement. He's the, one, he's the kind of man who comes alongside. The word encourager, encourage there is the word parakletos. It's the idea of coming alongside and helping. Oh, how we need this in our churches. The kind of spirit that desires to just come alongside and help. To help in times of need. To help perhaps even in times of discouragement. and times of struggle. God's desire is for His people to be encouraged. And to be encouraged by others who are going to encourage them. In Acts chapter 13, verse 43, we see Saul and Barnabas doing this kind of, by this point, Paul and Barnabas doing this kind of thing. It says they persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. In Acts chapter 14 and 22, we'll see it again, where it says they strengthened the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. I want us to notice six characteristics of an encourager in this passage as we look at the examples of Barnab- the example of Barnabas. Number one, we see that an encourager is willing to reach out to others. Barnabas was willing to leave Jerusalem, uh, travel a significant different distance over to Antioch uh, to minister to these people, and an encourager is willing to reach out to others. Number two, an encourager observes God's working in the lives of others and, and, and is aware of this. You see, he saw, uh, he had seen the grace of God and was glad. He saw what God was doing in their lives. And he identified that. And someone who is who is an encourager, is one who looks at what's happening in the lives of some, life of somebody, but he doesn't just see a, a worldly, circumstantial perspective. He sees a godly perspective. He sees God's perspective on what's happening, and he begins to, and, and he begins to see what God is doing or may be doing in the life of that individual, and he can, he can rejoice with what that person is doing, or perhaps weep with those who weep. This man was encouraged. Barnabas was encouraged by what was happening. It says he was glad. And that brings us to characteristic number three of an encourager. An encourager rejoices in God's blessing of others. He rejoices in the blessing of God in the lives of others. Do you do that? Do you look? I, I, I know some of you do because I've felt that I've been in a recipient of your encouragement i'm thankful for the people in our church that genuinely have this desire to encourage others and frankly all of us ought to have this desire to come alongside and to encourage to rejoice in what god is doing this is something that when you could see that god is working in a particular way to rejoice with them is something that is is of great encouragement to them Number next, an encourager supports faithful devotion in the lives of others. That is number four, by the way. I knew what number. I was just teasing. An encourager supports faithful devotion in the lives of others. He, it says here, they encourage them to do what? To purpose, with purpose of heart, that they should continue with the Lord. Barnabas came alongside and said, you got to continue with God. you got to stay with Christ. It's going to be hard. You've come to Christ, but you got to stay with Him. 
You ever met a new Christian that struggled and began to doubt what God was doing and how God could really be good and how God could really do, do what he's doing and how God could really, how could God be good and do what he's doing? And what that person needs is an encourager to come alongside and to say, and to say, look, just continue with Christ. An encourager finds strength in God's Spirit. You know, if, if, you, if you try to live a life where you're encouraging others, do you know what that's going to include? It's going to include empathy. What's empathy? You know, empathy is, is like you're going to go through it with them. Some people ha- are more inclined toward empathy than others. All of us as Christians ought to have how to cultivate a, a, a desire to be empath- empathetic with others. But man, it, is, it, is, it takes strength from, it takes divine strength to walk with someone through a dark time in their lives or a difficult time. It is gut wrenching. It is, it is hard. You have to do it. You have to go. There, there's got to be empathy. And that requires God's strength. Well, Barnabas had that. Verse 24 For he was a good man, and he was full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. He was a man who trusted God. He was a man who could look at circumstances and go through different things and watch people go through, through persecution or struggles in their lives and keep the faith. And it's almost as like because he was trusting God, others could come alongside and they could, they could trust the Lord because Barnabas' faith was strong. And then we find an encourager assists in bringing people to Christ. You know, all of this has, an, has a result to it. People came to Christ. Verse 24, and a great many people were added to the Lord through all of this. As Barnabas encouraged others to stay with Christ, to continue with him, and to do what God wanted them to do, they were encouraged by this, and they shared their faith with others, and people came to Christ. You usually don't think of someone who is going around encouraging everyone as a a witness, but they are, if if those people go and share Christ with others, and it continues. The encourager assists in bringing people to Christ. That's this man Barnabas, and oh how we need more people like that. How we ourselves need to have that kind of heart, that kind of spirit, a spirit of encouragement, a spirit who lifts others up. Philippians chapter 2, four says, uh, chapter 2 verse 4 says, Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. But that's not the only, only need that this church had in its beginning, in its inception, in its beginning growth. There was another need that the church had. And Barnabas, in his in desire to encourage others, he, he be, I think what happened here is he began to see another a need. He needed help. He couldn't handle all these people. So he needed help. But he needed someone that had a, a bit different giftedness than he did. And, I'll, and you'll notice who that person was. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And that's an interesting word. The word seek, it's actually the idea. He actually had a hard time finding Saul, apparently, from that word seek. Uh, Saul Saul was in Jerusalem, you recall, and then he made so much trouble in Jerusalem, he went back to Tarsus. Very likely, he he was planning for six years, he's actually in the ministry in Tarsus, in his home place, planting churches. Um, and, And then finally, Barnabas comes up and seeks out Saul. In verse 26, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with a church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. You see the word there? What did they do? They assembled with the church, all of them. There are this great massive amount of people in Antioch. And what did they do? They taught them. 
Well, why did Barnabas choose Saul? Well, Saul was a man who was gifted in teaching. He was a man who who was taught, who sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He was a man who was learned. He was a man who just understood how to break things down and develop arguments and cause people to realize uh, what, was true, what was true about the gospel and even, even to argue for the sake of the gospel. This was a man who was gifted to teach. And God understood that. And so in Barnabas' wisdom that surely God gave him, Barnabas says, you know, I, 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 I need to have that teacher guy, that, that, that giftedness to come and to teach the people. Now, I want to be careful about this. I don't want there to be too much of a discrepancy between these two men. What we find, we've already mentioned before, that Saul and Barnabas both encouraged the people. It wasn't as though Barnabas did only the encouraging and Saul did only the teaching, or that Saul did only the encouragement and Barnabas or, you know, or did only the teaching. No, they both did both. But clearly there was an emphasis in Barnabas in, in, in being a bridge builder and an encourager, and clearly there was an emphasis with Saul of being a teacher. And we, we obviously see that as he writes the New Testament. He's very, he's very structured in his writing, Paul is, uh, develops, is able to develop arguments and, and a very detailed. And that is necessary in the church too. You know, it's interesting, this church is growing, and I don't see any massive programs going on. I don't see these great ways to figure out all kinds of ways to grow the church. All I see is the gospel being preached, God's people getting a hold of it, living out the gospel, people being encouraged. I mean, it's these, these basic things and just teaching. And for a, a year, they're just teaching and teaching and teaching and teaching. Somebody says, well, how do you grow a church? Well, just teach. Teach the Word. I mean, just, just be faithful. And it's the Word that does the work. It's the Spirit of God that does the work. What we've got to do is be faithful to teach the Word. And we really, it's something that, you know, we, we want to do that as much as we can. That's why we have adult Sunday school classes and children's Sunday school classes. And Wednesday night, we, we have a, a, a different forum for teaching we don't it's not it's not a lecture style it's more of a and we have groups that we teach any way we can disseminate the word and get it into our minds and our thinking teaching is absolutely central and preaching is important you see the word preach all over the place in the book of acts but just the dissemination of the truth of the word of god is something that is absolutely necessary as well we must be faithful in teaching the word. That's what happened here. And by the way, you have sometimes you have small groups, and some people make this argument in the book of Acts that you know all it was was a bunch of small groups getting together. Well, small groups are great, but that's not all it was. You have this entire massive amount of people in this passage. They're all getting together, and Saul and Barnabas are teaching all of them for a year. There's nothing wrong with having a large group of people that you're teaching at same all at the same time. In fact, that is, in some cases, better. So, so we have this gift, this ministry of teaching. Now, what, what's the result of all of this? What happens? Well, we pick up in verse 27, and there's a man by the name of Agabus who comes. He has is, he is the gift of prophecy. Um, I will just, I'm not going to go into this, but, but we... we tend to believe that the gift of prophecy has ceased uh, as, as the Word of God has been completed. Uh, we won't go into all of that now, but at this point, the gift of prophecy was something that was active. And we pick up here in verse 27, and these days the prophets, and it's interesting, it says in these days, and in these days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there, were, there was going to be a great famine throughout the, all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. And that's exactly, his, history will verify this. That is exactly what happened during the days of Claudius Caesar, which was from 41 to 54, uh, 54 AD. And uh, right around... Between 45 and 47 AD, there was this massive famine 
It reached nearly all of the Roman Empire. It actually included uh, the, the, the area in Egypt. And during this time, you had basically a shortage of grain, which caused all kinds of economic problems. And the poor people of the church were, were not going to be able to survive if the, if the more wealthy people of the church did not help. And that's what you see here. There is this, as, as, and you know it's sort of interesting, you know the, ha- the people that have the money, it's the Gentiles. So, so in Antioch, in, in Jerusalem, what have they been doing so far, by the way, in Jerusalem? Though they've been, they have been sharing a lot already. There's almost this indication that they've been doing so much sharing that they're sort of depleted of their resources. That's not for sure, but it seems to be that that may be happening. And what you have here is, is this Gentile church that is growing, and, a, and they're being taught, and they're being encouraged, and as that is happening, the result is generosity. Notice what it says in verse 29. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. They met the need as they were able to. It says they did so uh, in relation to their own ability to do so, according to their ability. And you find that to be a principle in the New Testament, that as people, as you have ability to give, then there ought to be a desire to give. And as we grow in Christ, there is this, there is this desire to, do, to be generous to the work of Christ and to meet the needs of others. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says this, Therefore, verse 5, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and to prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you have previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As is written, he has dispersed abroad and has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now many he who, many, may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness, while you are enriched in everything for all your liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us, us to God. For the administration of the, this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgiving to God. In that passage, which really is probably, if you want to go to one passage that talks about New Testament giving, it would be 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And we see there that that is, that is the privilege. In, in, in New Testament giving, it is a privilege to give to God's work. God, as a person grows in the Lord, there is this, there is this desire to give to God's work. And God loves a cheerful giver. Is that possible? Is it possible to give cheerfully? How does that happen? Well, the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. There's got to be, how do you, do you ever love giving gifts to your kids? I love giving gifts to my kids. My kids say, you do? (laughs) (laughs) I love giving gifts to my kids, but I don't want to spoil them, so I'm careful. But I, uh, I, I do enjoy giving gifts to my kids. I love, why? Because I love them. And the way that you enjoy giving to God's work, giving to others, giving, is, is you love God. And you just love to give to Him because you love Him. It's a joy to give. And when God, when God sees that we really enjoy giving to Him, we are doing it out of a love for Him, It says he loves that. He loves a cheerful giver. So as we conclude, what are some things that we need to remember? Number one, God's hand must be on his work to fulfill his will. We've got to remember that. 
whether it's our families or our individual spiritual lives or this church, God's hand must be on his work to fulfill his will. Number two, we must seek to be used of the Lord to encourage others by identifying and confirming God's working in their lives. We, we, we ought to find ways of coming alongside and encouraging others. And we ought to be real, ready to teach others as well. These are gifts in the church that need to be developed. And folks, all of us, whether you are gifted in that area or not, all of us need to be Barnabases. We need that there's this command in Scripture to look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Every man. And it ought to be our desire to come alongside and encourage. And finally, when we are living out God's gospel grace in others, it will result in a generous attitude. Do you have a generous attitude? You say, you're talking about giving. You're like on thin ice here. Now, I, you know how often I talk about giving? You all know if you've been here any length of time, it's very infrequently. It's got to be in the text, basically. But the truth is, God wants, and, and it's, you know, you know it's, it's interesting, it's not that we, we, and we've got to think of it this way, it's not that we're giving to a person or giving to, a, giving to an organization, we're giving to the Lord. And we're cheerfully giving to the Lord. Do you know who gets shortchanged if we don't give to the Lord? It's not the Lord. Did you know that? Did you know God doesn't need you to give? You say, well, you're really confusing me now. He doesn't need you. God is completely sufficient. But God gives us the privilege of giving to him. We ought to want to give to him. And as we do that, he loves that. He loves a cheerful giver. And if we want to know, if we want to say, okay, well, I don't have that cheerful, generous heart before the Lord, then, then we ought to ask, sort of ask ourselves the question, well, am I growing? Because growth results in generosity, in a spirit of generosity. And we can ask those kinds of questions to help us to see if we're really growing spiritually or not. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we see the development of a church, this first Gentile church in Antioch, it certainly is a challenge to us and a reminder to us of the kind of things that are essentially important for us as, as your church. And I pray, dear Father, that you would help us to always keep the, the things that are important central in our church. Lord, help us to have a spirit of encouragement toward each other. Help us to be ready to come alongside and to help. Thank you for those in our midst that do have that. I've seen that even today. And I've seen it many times before, and I am so grateful for those who just have the spirit of encouragement toward others. And I pray, dear Father, that that would continue, that all of us, there is, there, there, there is something blessed about giving to others in that way, and it really, there is a, it's more blessed to give than to receive, even in our encouragement. Lord, may we be, may we be a church that teaches that teaches the truths, that doesn't shy away from the hard things to learn, that we teach all the whole counsel of God. May we always have that in our thinking. May we not desire to put forth our own agenda when it comes to the preaching and teaching of, of, of uh, something other than your word. Help us to always desire to simply disseminate your word to your people whether it's from this pulpit or in Sunday school classes, we thank you for the men that, outside of me that you have given to teach our people, and we thank you for that. And we pray that you would develop those gifts in our church and, and the women as well. And we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.